welcome to Watchtower History. In a normal democratic society for Jehovah's Witnesses who know that they have been told to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, unto God what is God's. They are very law-abiding, but they're very clear that their king is God and not any earthly state. So when the pressure really comes on in the Third Reich and everybody is uh, told to say Heil Hitler, which really puts Hitler at the highest point in somebody's life, to have compulsory military service, to swear on oath, then witnesses refuse to do this. They are not able in their conscience to be able to, to put uh, the, the rule of an earthly state above their God. So very quickly they come into conflict with the police and the authorities and are watched and then arrested and increasingly thrown first into prisons and then into labour and concentration camps. Largely on these grounds, refusing to undertake military service, refusing to give the Heil Hitler salute, uh, and refusing to be part of the Nazi pageantry. Jehovah's Witnesses' understanding of the Bible forbids paying undue honour to men, forbids military service, participation in political elections, and the worship of national symbols. A new salutation was instituted to impose political conformity. Everyone was now expected to raise their hand in greeting with a Heil Hitler, meaning salvation through Hitler. This was something Jehovah's Witnesses would not do. For them, salvation was only possible through Jesus Christ. It was amazing. From their pulpits, the churches zealously proclaimed their support for and allegiance to Hitler, urging all to vote yes in the upcoming national referendum. Wieder groß du mich Heil Hitler, das Bild der Führers Order. Du wirst entlassen und musst gehen. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Sieg! Heil! Sieg! Heil! Sieg! Heil! The whole class. Or standing there, you know. My fingers were like that. And I was determined, I said, I want those papers. Those papers, during the five minutes, they sounded like hours. My head got like this, my feet got small, I got cold and shivering. But the only thing I had in my mind, I want those papers because I want to hail my Lord. Although it was compulsory, I never used the greeting Heil Hitler, and that's why my problem started. And Jehovah's Witnesses do not look upon people as saviors, but only to our Creator and His Son, Jesus Christ. And so the battle lines were drawn between the Hitler regime and Jehovah's Witnesses. We could not go along with the ideology like the Hitler salute, which meant Heil Hitler, meaning that salvation only could come from Hitler. And uh, we know that salvation only can come through Jesus Christ from our Creator. And so therefore, we were persecuted. The point of the telegraph to me said, Joseph, what's the matter? We noticed you never raise your arm. He said, I never will. Why? I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I never would salute him because salvation comes from Christ Jesus, you know, through Christ Jesus from Jehovah God. I will never salute. I remember how strong we were how we didn't salute the flag, how we wouldn't say Heil Hitler, and how we acted a bit differently from other pupils. 
some days were hard, the teacher was like a, like a devil, and he took my hand, he said, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, and beat me. What you so frightened they would hit you, that you, did you never say Heil Hitler? No, no, they never said. Because my father said, look, Heil Hitler means the salvation comes from Hitler. As we learn of the Bible, the, the Heil, the salvation, comes by Jesus Christ. So the Romans 13 interpretation, which we've covered uh, in some of our other discussions already in the two witness rule, uh, this is what was the catalyst. This is what encouraged the witnesses to try to stand against Hitler you know, regardless of whether the interpretation was right or wrong, this is the foundation for why they, you know, a lot of why they did of what they did. So Henry Friedlander in his book talks about these categories of concentration camp prisoners. And he says in Nazi Germany, the witnesses were persecuted and committed to the camps because their religious conviction forced them not to join in. That is, they refused to give the Hitler's salute to join the Nazi party and to serve. So that was, again, one of the reasons, not the only reasons that they were persecuted there, but it was one of the reasons. And more importantly, it wasn't the beginning of the reasonings of why they yeah. were persecuted. And we'll get into that in a little bit. By July 33 the NSDAP had emerged as the only approved political party in Germany, basically the Nazi party. So on July 14th, the law against the reconstitution of parties was enacted, declaring the Nazi party the only legal political party and threatening prison terms of up to three years for any attempt to form a new party or maintain an existing one. On July 24th, the witnesses were banned throughout Germany. So in the newspapers of the period, you could find a lot of these stories as well. And so in one of the letters to the editor, it says some 6,000 Jehovah's Witnesses in Germany who refused to heil Hitler have been sent to a concentration camp. And the witnesses are the same group who refused to permit their children to salute the flag. Nothing's done about the refusal to salute the United States. Our guess is that the German contingents of the faith after they serve a season in a German concentration camp, will be happy to salute the flag of a country that permits them to enjoy their peculiar brand of religion unmolested. So I find that reprehensible, knowing what we know now, that in, in the United States newspapers, they're asking for the witnesses to be sent to concentration camps. Interesting. Now, Simone Leapster, her story is one of the most famous ones because she was a Jehovah's Witness child who refused to the Heil to Hitler. And even as a child, she had the conviction to stand firm against Hitler, to uh, refuse to back down because she says the Heil belongs to Jesus. And the New Testament says there is no other name under heaven whereby they must be saved. So... That was the, her reasoning behind that, you know, with and without her mother. You know, she's being interrogated about her convictions. And even from a young child, from a young age, as a young child, she had the convictions. And they ask her, who are the superior authorities? You know, that goes into that Romans 13 uh, discussion again. And she says, I don't understand the word authorities. They were asking. And she said, I replied honestly. Who has the right to give orders? And the answer is Jehovah and Jesus. Three times 97? Where does the watchtower come from? How did you come up with the answer 291? <laughs> Quickly, we have no time. We know you go to secret meetings, yes or no? No. For me, a meeting was in a hall. Our family get-together was in public. And so they're questioning her as a child, and she had the intelligence and the response to give to those who are questioning her. She did end up in a camp, but for children, they're trying to re-educate her. 
and we'll cover a lot of her story as we go on because her story really covers the main points of a lot of these things that are going on with the witnesses as we go through this story. So in, in the January 1st, 1965 Watchtower, it says, Regarding Hitler, remember how he demanded that everyone worship the state? Anyone who would not hail Hitler with his arm raised to the swastika was sent off to a concentration camp to die. Now, this story about the Kusaro family, you know, has been covered in uh, several of the Watchtower films on this period. But I like what's written here. It says, I scooped up the Watchtower pamphlets and put them in my knapsack. Magdalena stuffed the books into hers and we ran outside and hid the literature behind the bushes. At eight, I knew to walk over to the coops and feed the, er, and feed the chickens. Magdalena, who was nine, picked up a bottle to feed the baby lamb. So when the Nazis would come, even as children, they knew, let's get the literature out of here. Uh, every day, the teacher reprimanded me for not saluting the Nazi flag. The big black swastika on the red banner flew over the schoolhouse and hung on a pole in every classroom. My stomach churned as I tried to think of how I could avoid saluting or saying Heil Hitler. My parents had taught me to salute only Jehovah God. The teacher always watched me. So Elizabeth, you do not want to join in praise of our leader? Come to the front of the classroom. She turned to the others. Children, Elizabeth thinks it's right to insult our leader. In spring of 1939, the principal came into my class. Elizabeth, since you refuse to salute our flag and say Heil Hitler, it is obvious that your parents are neglecting your spiritual and moral development. I have taken it upon myself to obtain a court order to remove you and your two younger brothers from your home. The three of you will be sent to a place where you'll be given the proper instruction. And so that's what happened to a lot of these children uh, of the Bible students or the Jehovah's Witnesses of the period. They were treated differently than the Jews. They thought that they could re-educate them. They tried to re-educate them, not just the adults, but also the children. They thought, you know, that they were uh, confused and that, that if given the proper education, they would come to their senses. And, and, and again, a reminder, that only applied to German Aryan people. Yeah, um, that Hitler was very, um, in his own way, was very compassionate toward his own people in some aspects. Uh, the same thing that applies to drug addicts, homosexuals, alcoholics. Hitler was willing to um, re-educate re -educate them and rehabilitate them back into society. But the witnesses refused to be re-educated, and they just doubled down on what they had already uh, uh, they doubled down on their convictions and what they had already believed. It only encouraged them further rather than discouraged them. And the, the September 1st, 1985 Watchtower has a little bit more of their story, if you're interested in checking that out. Children were drawn into the battle. Six-year-old Paul Gerhard Kusero, like other witness children, was pressured by students and teachers. As soon as I entered school, the head teacher and the pupils confronted me and tried to make me say Heil Hitler, to salute the flag and to sing Nazi songs. Going to school was not nice, since one never knew what would happen. More than 800 children were taken away from their witness parents by the Gestapo. Paul Gerhardt, along with his brother and sister, was placed in a Nazi school. The educationist Velpot, a member of the Nazi party, was convinced that the Kusaro children were brought up in the wrong spirit by their parents. In order to put a stop to any further subversive influence on the children, and because of an alleged danger to public safety and order, their father, Franz Kusaro, 
was taken into so-called protective custody in May 1936. By court order, it was decided to take us children away from the so-called bad influence of our parents. So they took us, one day we went to school and we had to go to see the principal, but we didn't have, we didn't, we hadn't done anything bad, so we went there and when we got to the principal's office, there was already a policeman sitting there and they told us we could not go back to our mother because they had to take us, the policeman took us to a reformatory school in order to be, be readjusted in our thinking or our beliefs or our convictions according to Nazi ideology. That's why they took us away. After the ban on the movement, family courts began to take away the children of members of the movement, making almost 400 of them wards of the state and assigning them to foster parents. This activity increased as more of the parents were sent to concentration camps, making the children orphans in the eyes of the state. Unlike Jewish children who would be sent in large numbers to extermination camps and concentration camps, children of witnesses would be indoctrinated in Nazi beliefs. The increasing persecution of witnesses was probably little noticed by most Germans, unlike the persecution of Jews, a far more numerous group. As you heard before from Simon Liebster, intimidation and retaliation also extended to school-age witness children, both inside Germany and in occupied Europe. More than 860 minor children were involuntarily separated from their parents and sent either to custodial care in a reform school, a juvenile home, or a Nazi orphanage. Obviously, school officials, police, juvenile and district courts ruled that witness parents had endangered their child's welfare by not conforming to the rules of a Nazi educational system. Should both these parents and children survive at the end of the war, parents actually had to go back into German courts and have the formal suspension of this rule called 1066. It's a part of the civil law code in Germany and it still exists today. You had to formally regain your custody of your own child that you had never really given up but had been forcibly taken from you by the state. And these are one of the tragedies. When you read literature about victimized children of the Holocaust today, it's very interesting to note that very few books include passages on the children of Jehovah's Witnesses. Simone Liebster was taken from her mother when she was 12. But what's interesting is later on she married a Jehovah's Witness, but this Jehovah's Witness was a Jewish man who was witness to while he was in the concentration camp. And he saw the Jehovah's Witnesses stood firm for their convictions. He saw how the Witnesses tried to help other people in the camps. And that touched his heart. Uh, just the stories of kindness is what convinced him that he should at least consider the Jehovah's Witnesses as a faith. So the 1974 yearbook also has stories about how children are taken away from their parents, how they are ostracized by classmates, by teachers, uh, by principals, uh, and put into re-education camps. Again, the Nazis really believed that they, they were just confused and that they might have had the power to re-educate these children. So they at least made an effort to do it. But these children had firm convictions. I, I think their parents brought them up right. They had strong faith in what they had believed and they refused to back down. They stood firm. So there's a story in the February 22nd, 1988 Awake magazine about Horst Henschel. And he says that before he was baptized, he withdrew from the Hitler Youth Movement because of his convictions, because of what he was learning from the Jehovah's Witnesses. He says, when I refused to give the Hitler greeting, I was struck by my teachers. His grandparents were opposed to the JWs, and we saw that similarly in Simone's story as well. They gained custody from the parents, so he had to live with his grandparents who did not like the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they didn't even allow him to read the Bible. So they refused to let him uh, worship in any way possible. But again, he remembered what he had been taught and he, he stuck to it. 
So Heinrich Dornrich and his brother were taken and put into a reformatory for children. Again, the Nazis trying to re-educate the children. The Nazis believed the children were brainwashed, and it was hoped they could help the children. Yet what they did only made the resolve of these children even stronger. So they didn't convince them at all that they were wrong. They only convinced them more that they were right. And we'll see as Himmler and some of the other Nazi uh, commander of several of the concentration camps, when they saw some of these stories of the witnesses or saw some of these activity of the witnesses, some of their positions changed before the end of the war. And you'll see sometimes that the witnesses got special treatment. And so we'll look at some of that special treatment here in a little bit. Anna Turpin said that her schoolmates began to treat her like an outcast because she didn't want to give the Nazi salute. Some boys even beat me when the teachers were not looking. Eventually they left me alone. But even my friends told me that their fathers had forbidden them to play with me. I was too dangerous. Two months after the Nazis took power in Germany, they banned JWs as a danger to the state. And so even the children were put at odds with each other because of what's going on. Uh, and they're hearing it in the newspapers and the radio, uh, uh, in their churches, they're hearing it all over the place. The Jehovah's Witnesses and the Jews are dangerous to the state, and so you should keep away. In the May 22nd, 1983, Awake, there's an article entitled, I Grew Up in Nazi Germany. And the gentleman says, you know, at pointing at Herta and me, his sister, they said to my horrified mother, we're taking these children. You are not qualified to bring them up. And Hans Nomen says, in 1935, a group of Gestapo officers, huge to my five-year-old eyes and menacing, barged into our home. I can still see my father standing there quietly as they roughly searched the house for evidence that he was a Bible student. Finally, they took him away. I didn't see him again for 10 years. But the Hitler regime had not finished with us. Two years later, the Gestapo returned in the shape of a man and a woman. And pointing at us, they said, why? And they said, you're not qualified to bring them up. And so they took them away. They took them to a ju juvenile camp. Uh, and, and he said, I endured the military discipline of that camp. I was kept separate from Herta until 1943. Then I was sent to a farm near a little town in the province of Altmark. At this time, I had no idea why these things were happening to me. He was just a child. My parents had been careful about what they told me, probably because five-year-old boys are not noted for being careful about what they blurt out. Hence, I did not understand why I had been separated from them, nor did I understand why the farmer who was responsible for me used to scold me and shout at me I was a criminal, or why other children would have nothing to do with me. And so there's so many of these stories of how these children are ripped from their parents. And they tried to unbrainwash them as, as the Nazis were trying to claim. So Constantine Weigland also had a similar story. He says that when he refused the Heil Hitler greeting, he was constantly harassed by the Hitler youth classmates. And in the December of that year, his parents were served with a summons to appear. It was claimed, we are being spiritually neglected by our parents. Court officials were amazed when they heard us youngsters, now 16, 15, 14, and 8 years of age, defending our faith by using the scriptures. And as children, they're saying this. We noted that Heil Hitler means salvation comes from Hitler, and that since salvation comes only from Jehovah, God through Jesus Christ, we could not use that slogan. Nevertheless, the court ruled that we be taken from our parents and sent to a reform school. Before we could be picked up, my parents took us children to the railway station and sent us to our grandmother. They did this because their court case was pending and they feared the out outcome. On the station platform, mother, with tears in her eyes, said firmly, Jehovah is a better protector 
than we are, hugging us for what they felt might be the last time. Our parents quoted Isaiah 40, 11, like a shepherd, he will shepherd his own drove with his arm. He will con- collect together the lambs and his, in his bosom, he will carry them. We felt greatly comforted to the total, total surprise of our parents. The case against them was dismissed for lack of evidence. In the October 1st, 1997 Tower, Rudolf Greichen tells his story of when he was just 12. He says, things got very difficult for us at home, but we quickly learned to trust in Jehovah. One day when I came home from school, my mother was reading the Watchtower. She wanted to fix me a quick lunch, so she laid the magazine on top of a small cupboard. After lunch, while we were putting the dishes away, there was a loud knock at the door. It was a policeman who wanted to search our apartment for Bible literature. I got very scared. It was an unusually hot day, so the first thing the policeman did was take off his helmet and place it on top of a table. He then proceeded with his search. While he was looking under his table, his helmet began to slide off. So my mother quickly grabbed the helmet and placed it on the cupboard right on top of the watchtower. The policeman ransacked our apartment, but he didn't find any literature. Of course, he never thought of looking under his own helmet. (laughs) When he was ready to leave, he mumbled his apology to my mother while reaching behind his back to grab his helmet. What a relief I felt. Uh, I'm going to question that. Okay, Um, go ahead. Sometimes witnesses exaggerate the stories a little and this and that, and it gets told down. Um, I've never reached to grab my hat behind my back. Now, to the side, maybe, you know, like that, but not, you know, reach behind while you're talking to somebody. Usually, you'll turn toward a side direction. And yes, you could look away and while there's the hat, grab it and move on. But behind the back, I'm going to, I'm going to call, I'm going to call that one out. Okay. I, I, not in a I, negative way. And, and, and I'm saying it may have happened, but I think it got a little, little exaggerated there. I, I don't know. I, I tend to believe stories like this because it's not just a Jehovah's Witnesses who tell stories like this under the Nazi persecution. Or but are, they all, are they all exaggerating a little bit? I mean, no one you know, reaches behind their back to get there. They reach behind I don't their know, back. I, I think the way you were doing it like this, <laughs> like this, I don't think it was like that. I think it'd be more like you were just showing earlier. But you'll find, you know, in Richard Wormbrand's story, Torture for Christ, this Lutheran minister, when they were under communism in Romania, you're going to find a lot of similar stories like this of how there are these narrows escape of them trying to find Bibles or evidence that they were Christians. You know, they, they, they were protected both before they were put in prison and during their experience in prison and the way that they got out of prison. If you haven't read tortured for Christ or seen the movie, it's a powerful lesson of, again, standing firm for your faith. And that was from a Lutheran minister and his wife. But in this case, Rudolph says, when he was taken to a re-education camp, uh, there was an announcement to the entire class. He says, Bo- it said, boys, tomorrow we'll go on a class outing. Everybody liked the idea. Then he added, all of you should wear your Hitler youth uniforms. So that when we march through the streets, all can see that you are nice Hitler boys. The next morning, all the boys showed up in their uniforms, except me. The teacher called me to the front of the classroom and asked me, look around at the other boys and then look at yourself. He added, I know that your parents are poor and cannot afford to buy you a uniform, but let me show you something. He brought me to his desk, opened a drawer and said, I want to give you this brand new uniform. Isn't it beautiful? I would rather have died than put on a Nazi uniform. When my teacher saw that I had no intention of wearing it, he got angry and the entire class booed me. Then he took me to the outing, but tried to hide me by making me walk in the middle of all the other boys in their uniforms. However, many people in town could see me as I stood out among the other classmates. Everybody knew my parents and I were Jehovah's Witnesses. I am thankful for Jehovah for giving me the needed spiritual strength when I was young. 
So persecution again as as children. Uh, Ursula Kraus Schmidt in has his book has a treatise Resistance and Persecution of Female JWs, and she says that there were two reasons for is issuing a protective custody case arrest warrant against her. First, Katarina Thonis was accused of holding prohibited JW meetings in her apartment, and the Gestapo's proof was based on denunciations which mentioned frequent visits to the apartment in question in closed windows and doors. That was the evidence. The more serious reason was that what Katarina Thonis did not want to surrender her son to the enticements and distortions of the Nazi system but instead raised him according to her beliefs and values. These alternative values, basically anti-military, were considered subversive since the Nazi state wanted total control of every individual and they couldn't find out what happened to, to her and her son. You know, there's no documentation for the rest of her story. In the Imprisoned for Their Faith, Jehovah's Witnesses in K.L. Auschwitz, it says, in some instances, Whole families were arrested. So an example, in April 1943, they arrested Helena Sinsiawa from Chichen. After interrogation in the Gestapo office, she was taken to Auschwitz and given a number. Her father was brought to Auschwitz two months later. And another period of two months, the same happened to Eva, Helena's mother, who died in the camp. The reason for arrest and deportation in each of these cases was the same. Membership and the religious sect of Jehovah's Witnesses. And the documentation for that is in the footnote there. And so there are documents that talk about uh, some of these things as well. And this one is about the JW refusal to send their children to the Hitler Youth. And this was mandatory after 1939. So this has resulted in additional cases of the Nazis removing the parental custody. So there is a book that was published... This book was published by the editor of the Golden Age in Germany, and it was published only in Polish, French, and German. And it was called Crusade Against Christianity. And in this book, it has a lot of the stories of many of the Jehovah's Witnesses of the time period in the persecutions that they were suffering and, and what was happening to them. They had even put in uh, images of the concentration camps. And we'll look a little bit more at this book in just a little bit. But in this a book, they had this declaration about the children. So the document says, please send me for November 20th, the current year, a report about the observations that could be made about the teachers of children whose parents are Bible students. There will be noted that if these children do, because of the influence of their father's home, have anti-elitist designs and oppose passive resistance to all attempts to bring them to other concepts. It should not be limited to a simple listing of recorded cases, but to give details. In case number two, not in your children's classes, laying at terms, it will be necessary to issue a negative report. And so they're using these reports to say, hey, we can take your children. We were allowed to write a letter once a month. If the letter didn't pass the censors, it came back. There were no two ways about that. After work, we were allowed to take walks in the camp road. There, prisoners who were Bible students approached us, but we weren't really interested. My father was a communist, and I'd been brought up without any faith. The small family that had been torn apart were hoping to be reunited soon. When the two women got mail from Dachau one day, they were overjoyed. I hope to get mail from you this week to hear that you are alive and kicking, something I can say about myself. The rations are good, I'm all right. I miss you so much. Together with this letter came a telegram, which my mother didn't open until later. 
It notified us of my father's death. He must have been killed on July the 6th, for according to the letter, he'd been healthy and feeling well up till then. Of course, this changed our way of thinking. Now we were happy to be approached by the Bible students. We talked with them a lot. My eyes were opened to God's word and to all his wonderful promises and, above all, to how, in ancient times, God had always fulfilled his promises. Thus we gained confidence and that really helped us to cope with this terrible situation. Wolfgang was beheaded on March the 28th, 1942. The night before, he wrote, My dear parents and my dear brothers and sisters, I shall leave you as your third son and brother early in the morning. Be not sad. The time will come when we shall be together again. Those who sow with tears will reap with joy. In James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which Jehovah has promised to them that love him. In this faith and in this conviction, I go from you, your son and brother, Wolfgang. So this Simone Leapster, she has an example of one of the letters that she sent to her father and from her father while she was in the camp. And she says, you know, a dear father, the much desired letter finally arrived and brought me much joy. How important that we, the time that we live in and how great are the events. So even as a child, she recognized what was going on and, and understood that the what this persecution meant and what it might what might possibly happen to her parents or to herself as she got older. The prisoners in the Nazi camps were allowed to send letters in and out of the camps. Uh, sometimes they could get food packages uh, or they could trade certain things. At a certain point, as a punishment, the Bible students were restricted from sending and receiving letters. So at a certain point, they could only write one letter a month to their families, and they weren't allowed to write more than 25 words per letter. And so that was a special regulation just for the JWs. And that it was applied in all the concentration camps, and that was for at least three and a half years. In Buchenwald, it was that way till the end of the war. So in order to indicate that correspondence was restricted, so that inquiries from relatives would have to be answered individually, the SS instructed the censorship office to stamp the following note on the letters. The prisoner continues to be a stubborn Bible student and refuses to reject the Bible student's false teachings. For this reason, he has been denied the usual privileges of correspondence. Well, well to the families outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses, outside of the camps, they considered the stamp as evidence that the writers had remained faithful. So, so one of the Jehovah's Witness writers, remind, you know, when they reminisce about this, they said, we were less interested in the contents of the letter for what could one say in five lines, but the stamp always brought us joy. So I, I like that one. Well, it, it is comical how, how the <laughs> SS put that on a stamp <laughs> that the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I say Jehovah's Witnesses, that's after you know, they're under new teachings by this point, false teachings. <laughs> so there's a few examples of some of these letters, but I like the one on, uh, on this slide, this letter number 14 from Hezzy's book. He says, my email is restricted from now on. I'm neither allowed to write nor receive email or money. <laughs> and of course, it's got a little stamp on it there. Here's another one. 
Usually it's possible for me to write only five lines every three months. A few weeks ago, I was informed that I've been deleted from the barber's list and therefore they were repossessed the license that's at home. Do these, due to these circumstances and also my physical affliction, you know that I am forced to sell. Do this and make use of the money for you and the children. I can no longer properly pursue my profession anyway, but it will be healthier. How is your health, your children, parents, and everyone, and hopes of seeing you soon, your dear Hans? Don't send me mail or money before I let you know my new prisoner number. He died later on in the camp there. And the one I really like is this story here from Deliana Raidmakers of the Netherlands. So she was given an opportunity to write the final letter. And that's actually the handwritten letter there to her family. And the letter basically says, I know what I have to do. I promise to do Jehovah's will. Uh, egoism must be put aside. We have served energetically. We will always serve God. We will be led by his spirit. We will praise heaven. Next time you soft paper, please. Don't send me any candles and a list of things that should be put into my laundry bag. I hope I will be released one day without the necessity of Psalms 18.5, which says the ropes of death encircled me. The psalm quote here suggests that she knew what her fate might be, and her death certificate was December 10th, 1942, just shortly after this letter was written. <laughs> 